You can start, Rohan. Okay. <laughs> so, in number theory, there are sort of four main concepts. And this is one of them. It's about greatest common divisors and LCMs, these common multiples. The GCD of two numbers is the largest uh, number D such that D divides A and D divides B. So for example, GCD of 25 and 30 would be five because five divides both of these and nothing larger does. The LCM is defined similarly. It's the smallest uh, D such that A divides D and B divides D. So if we look at the same two numbers, their LCM would be 150 because it's six times 25 and five times 30 and no smaller number is a multiple of both of these. One property about DCD and LCM is that GCD of A and B times LCM of A and B equals AB itself. And I think the most important property for the AMCs is how to actually compute them given a number. So if you have a number that and you can write it as a product of primes. So one prime to some exponent times another prime to some other exponent. And you continue. I should call this A. And then B is another one prime time to one exponent times another prime to another exponent, so on. Then if we look at the primes that show up in each expansion, let's say we have for some prime P, we have an exponent of E here and an exponent of F here. In the GCD, the exponent of P is P to the minimum of E and F because this will divide both of them. And the LCM would have P to the maximum of E and F. And this will also imply the condition about the product. So now we have an example problem which asks that if LCM of N and 18 equals 180 and GCD of N and 45 is 15, it's essentially asking what is N. And when you see conditions like this on the problem statement, it usually means that they want you to find N, but they don't want you to be able to look at the answer choices and directly pl plug that back in to sort of use process of elimination. And here we do this by looking at the prime factorization of N, which is the name for this decomposition into primes. We have 18 is two times three squared and 180 is two squared times three squared times five. This also implies that n cannot have any prime factor greater than five because otherwise LCM of n and 18 would be a multiple of that prime factor, which it isn't here. And that is because prime factorizations are unique. This is called the fundamental theorem of arithmetic in case you're interested. And 
we now have that n is of the form 2 to some exponents times 3 to some exponents times 5 to some exponents. We also have maximum of a and 1 is 2 because that's what happens when we consider p equals 2 in this uh, calculation. And we similarly have max of b and 2 is 2 and max of c and 0 is 1. That's because when we see this 5 in 180, it's essentially 5 to the 1. And there is no multiple of 5 in 18. And we can add in a 5 to the 0 because any positive integer to the 0 power is always 1. This also immediately tells us what a and c are because we have that the greater of a and one is two and one itself is not two, so that implies a is two. Similarly, the third condition implies that c is zero. The second condition just implies that b is at most two because in this case, the maximum would be two, which is correct. But if b is any larger, it would be the maximum and it would have to be equal to two. We also have this condition, um, I mean, c equals one, yes, because the greater of c and zero is one, and that would be c. We also have this condition of gcd of n and 45 equals 15. So now we can write n equals 2 to the a, which is 2 times 3 to the b, which is at most 2, times 5 to the c, which is 1. And then we can quickly substitute that in for 2 and 5. And 45 is 9 times 5, so it's 3 squared times 5. And 15 is 3 times 5. So <clears throat> we now look at each prime separately. The only primes that show up in any of these factorizations are 2, 3, and 5. So we only consider those. From 2, we got that minimum of the 2 in n and the 0 in 45 is 0. And from 5, we get that the minimum of 1 in n and 1 in 45 is one is the 1 in 15. Neither of these actually tell us anything new. And that's a good thing, because we already figured out deterministically what the exponents of 2 and 5 would be. So if we had any new information, that could contradict what we previously had. The important exponent to look at here is a still undetermined exponent of three. And we have that the minimum of the b in three and the b in n and the two in 45 is the one in 15, which gives that b equals one. Then n equals two squared times three times five, which is 60. And that will give six because the sum of the digits of 60 is six plus zero, which is six. Are there any questions about that? Okay. Another to topic that frequently appears are a few special functions, which tell us what's the number of distinct positive divisors. The number, the sum of these factors.
And the, I think, rarest one is the number of smaller and that are um, of a smaller than and such that GCD of A and N is uh, one. And as usual, when we are talking about GCD and LCM, here we assume that A is positive. So for example, if we take the number six, its divisors are one, two, three, six, so there's four. The sum of one, two, three, and six is 12. And only one and five are relatively primed to have GCD one with six, of which there are two. And the important thing to know about these is how to get the these numbers from the prime factorization of n. <laughs> so let's suppose we have n equals p1 to the e1, p2 to the e2, until pk to the ek for primes p1 and positive e, for primes p and positive e, as in the previous example. The number of divisors of n are can be found by considering their prime factorizations. For each of these primes, Look at, for instance, P1. Let's suppose we have D divides N. Then P1's exponent in D must be at most E1. Because otherwise, if there's no way to multiply something to D, to decrease the exponent of P1. We got a similar condition for the rest of the primes. So the number of positive divisors is the number of <clears throat> EIs for the D such that they are all between zero and the corresponding exponents in N. Since the exponents can technically be zero here, there are E1 plus one choices for the exponents of P1, E2 plus one for the exponents of P2, up to ek plus one for p to, for pk. The sum of these factors can be again done by considering each prime separately. The factors have exponents for p one, p one to the zero plus p1 to the 1, plus p1 to the 2, until p1 to the e1. We have similar for our other primes. And we can fully write this out. And the reason why this is equal to the sum of all of the factors is because if you expand this, each term will be taking some elements from here, some elements from here, etc., and some elements from here. They'll be multiplying them. And this will uh, go, get to the prime factorization of a number that divides n. And since we're adding everything in each parentheses, we are adding all of the factors. And in case you ever like want to compute this specifically for n, a helpful fact is that for some r and some k, we have this identity. Which you can prove, for instance, by multiplying both sides by r minus 1 and noting that most of the terms on the left hand side cancel.
And for the number that are around that have GCD one, we can again look at each prime separately. Let's say we have some number P1 to the E1. The numbers which are relatively prime to this and which have GCD1 with this, the term for that is relatively prime, must not be multiples of P1 because otherwise the GCD would be a multiple of P1. And this is a sufficient condition. So we just want the number that are not a multiple of P1 and are less than or equal to this. I mean, strictly less than, but it doesn't matter unless it's equal to one. Actually, never mind. This should be at most. And, but again, this only really makes a difference when you are working with n equals one, because otherwise GCD n, n is n itself, which is almost never one. So there are P1 to the E1 numbers in total, and there are P1 to the E1 minus one multiples of P, which are specifically P1 times one, P1 times two, until P1 times P1 to the E1 minus one. So the number that aren't a multiple of P are P1 to the E1, Minus, it is P1 to the E1 minus P1 to the E1 minus one. And the reason why you can just multiply this over all primes is a bit more complicated. So I'm not going to get into that, but this is the formula you got as the number of such smaller numbers. And for these formulas, they're a bit hard to remember when you first see them. But usually, if you understand how you get to them, that's the most important part. And there will be some problems that are dealing with slight variants of these. So for them, knowing the formula wouldn't help you by itself. But understanding how you get to the formulas would basically finish the problem. And this problem deals with the number of distinct positive divisors. So we have some n equal to, let's say p1 to the e1 times p2 to the e2 times dot 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 times pk to the ek. And we want the number of positive divisors of n to be 2021. And this number is e1 plus one, e2 plus one, until ek plus one. Note that 2021 is equal to 43 times 47, which you might not remember, but typically it's Important to note the prime factorizations of the current year. For instance, um, 2023 is seven times 17 squared. And from this, you can uh, note that 43 and 47 are both prime, so you can't decompose them anymore. S since the EIs are all positive, all the terms here are at least two. So there can only be two terms, one of which is 43, the other of which is 47. So E1 and E2 are 42 and 46 in some order. And we want to minimize N. And from here, what we do is that we take the smallest prime, which is two, give it the higher exponent, which is 46. Then we take the second smallest prime, three, and give it the other exponent, 42. And this gives us 16 times six to the 42 by rewriting this as two to the four times two to the 42 times three to the 42. And then 
we have 16 plus 42 equals 58 for the answer. I mean 58, I think I said 48. Are there any questions? Another important topic is divisibility rules. The divisibility rules for certain primes are up to 11 are frequently used in these problems. So I will quickly describe them. The div divisibility condition for two is that the last digit is even. The divisibility rule for three is that the sum of the digits is a multiple of three. For five, the last digit is a multiple of five. I'm going to go over 11 for now. I mean, like, like pass over it for now. I'm going to add a nine because it's basically the same as three. Is that the sum of the digits? Is a multiple of nine. And we have the related 11 alternating difference of the digits is a multiple of 11. Here, alternating difference means that if you have something such as 539, you take the first digit minus the next plus the next. If we add another digit here, we continue like this. And this is 11, which is indeed a multiple of 11. Some brief intuition about why these are true is that when we write a number in the decimal system, let's say the last digit is A and the rest of the digits form this number B, what the base 10 system means, or the decimal system, is that this number is equal to 10B plus A. 10 is a multiple of two and five, so this part is always a multiple of two and five. Therefore, their sum is a multiple of two and five only when A is. So this gives the divisibility conditions for two and five. For three and nine, it's because of a similar reason. If we write the digits as, let's say, uh, A, B, C, D, E. I'm going to stop here, but you can keep going if you want. This is A plus 10 times B plus 100 times C plus 1,000 times D plus 10,000 times E, which is A plus B plus C plus D plus E. And then you have a bunch of multiples of 9. And since these are multiples of nine, they do not affect divisibility by either three or nine. For 11, it's a similar concept. We take this, and this is a minus b plus c minus d plus e plus 11b plus uh, 99, which is nine times 11c. 1001 is also multiple of 11. And so is 9999. Nine, nine, nine. So the multiples of 11 do not affect the visibility by 11, which gives the condition for 11. 7 is more complicated because it's neither a multiple of 10, 10 minus 1, which is 9, or 10 plus 1, which is 11. In fact, you would have to go up to pairs of three digits 
where 7 divides 1001. So the divisibility condition for 7 is that if you have groups of uh, three digit numbers, you take the alternating difference. So for instance, if you have the number one, four, three, four, eight, nine, oh, seven, you can group them into three like this. Then you do 14 minus 348 plus 907. And I don't really want to do this calculation right now, but if you do it, you'll see that the result is not a multiple of seven. So this number isn't either. And here you might notice that we have a relatively big three digit number and our divisibility trick for seven will not help with that, which is why seven is not really a great number to do divisibility conditions with. You're always going to have this chance of getting down to a three digit number and having to just manually divide it by seven to see if it's a multiple. Here we, for this problem, we will need divisibility by seven, although we won't need divisibility by 11. We have this number with digits two, zero, two, one, zero, eight. And when you have these underlines under the number, that just signifies that these are the digits of the number. And that is typically used when you have, for instance, this variable A, and they don't want you to think that they're doing the number 20, 2,210 times A. Instead, they're just uh, writing these as digits. And we can now go through a bunch of divisibility conditions. We want this to be prime. Since it's large enough, it can't be a multiple of any relatively small prime number. So like basically in the range we just looked at. Uh, if we look at the prime p equals two, and we look, first let's write down the possibilities for a. We can eliminate the even digits from divisibility by two, and we can also eliminate five from divisibility by five. The sum of the digits is 2 plus 2 plus 1 plus a. So 5 plus 1 cannot be, 5 plus a cannot be a multiple of 3. This rules out 1 and 7 because 6 and 12 are both multiples of 3. This uh, narrows it down to uh, 3 and 9. And here you can use p equals 11 to finish. The alternating difference of the digits is 2 minus 0 plus 2 minus 1 plus 0 minus a, which is 3 minus a. And this cannot be a multiple of 11. But for the digit 3, it's 0, which is a multiple of 11. In fact, 0 is the multiple of anything because you just multiply it by 0. So it can't be 3 either which leaves us with nine. In fact, you didn't even need to do the divisibility by two if you wanted, because if you look at the answer choices, all of them are uh, odd. So just looking at the answer choices they give would have saved a step. And another important concept are number bases. And essentially what they are is that they're a sort of generalization of the decimal system. If you have a number with digits, for instance, A, B, C, it could go on to more digits, but um, it's the same concept. And you're in base uh, N, then we have that A, B, and C are digits, which are 
uh, non-negative, which are integers between zero and n minus one inclusive. So they can be anything that is at least zero and at most n minus one, just like how in base 10, the decimal system, they can be at least zero and at most nine. And the value of this is C plus B n plus A n squared. If you add more digits, they are coefficients of n cubed and to the fourth, et cetera. And if you note, the base 10 system is this exact thing. It's the unit digit times one plus the 10 digit times 10 plus the 100 digit times 100, etc. And I don't think this is really relevant to AMCs, but you can also go into the decimal places for base n. For instance, if you add decimals d and e, then you add d times one over n plus e times one over n squared. This is an example of how number bases work. This is also sort of an algebra problem once you uh, understand how the number bases work, but it's an important demonstration. So I included it in today's session. The number three, two d in base n, is equal to 263 in base 10. And the number 3 to 4 in base 10 equals 1, 1, D1 in base 6. The first one tells us that 3n squared plus 2n plus D equals 263. The second tells us that 3n squared plus 2n plus 4 equals 6 plus 6 sorry, one plus 60 plus 36 plus 216. This is 37, this is um, 253. Now we can subtract the two equations. This gives us D minus four equals 263 minus 60 minus 253. These become 10 and grouping the D terms and the constant terms, we got 70 equals 14, so D equals two. And now that we know D equals two, we can plug that back into either of these conditions. I would prefer to use the first one. And that gives us that three N squared plus two N plus two equals 263. And then from here, solving this is an algebra part, and you can get the answer from that. One important thing about this is that you can still subtract numbers in base n. So if you notice the same digits from the start, you can immediately just think about subtracting them. You cannot, however, subtract these two because they're in different bases. You would have to convert them to the same base first. So now, uh, are there any questions about that? Okay. So now um, we are going to do geometry. And one of the main concepts of geometry are angles. There are two main properties about angles. And this is one demonstration about them. The first property is that the sum of the angles in a triangle is 180 degrees. The second is that if you have any number of lines dividing one side of a line, the sum of the angles is still 180 degrees. And that means that the sum of the angles around one point is 360 degrees.
We also have several other properties such as that. Um, if you have an isosceles triangle, the two marked angles are equal. And that is how, along with the previous fact, we can approach this first problem. Because ADCB is a square, this is a right angle, so its measure is 90 degrees. We can now find this angle by noting that the sum has to be equal to one uh, has to be equal to 360 degrees. So 90 plus 110 is 200. And to reach 360, this much must be 160 degrees. Now we have a 160 degree angle. And we also are told that DE equals DF. So the other two angles are the same and they add with 160 to make 180 which means that their sum is 20. Therefore, they are each 10. Finally, we want to find angle AFE. And when we add it to 10, we need to get 180, which tells us that it's 170. Are there any questions about that? Another very, probably the most important topic in AMC geometry are similar triangles. So what it means for two triangles to be similar is that they are essentially the same figure, maybe translated, rotated, or scaled, but they're very similar in nature. So there are a few main types of similarity there's ASA similarity or AAS similarity, which has, says that if two corresponding angles are equal and we have that, actually no, uh, it's just AA similarity. The others are for congruence. If we have any, if we have that any two corresponding angles are equal, the triangles are similar. There's also similarity from side lengths, which is SAS. So if we have a side length A, a side length B, a side length C, a side length D, and equal angles between them, if the ratio A over B is equal to C over D, then these triangles are similar. And when we have similar triangles, we can also fill in the rest of the conditions. So for example, in the AA condition, this forces that the last angles are also equal and the corresponding side lengths are all in proportion. So if these are A, B, and C, these are KA, KB, and KC, etc. And when we have a right triangle, We, information such as the hypotenuse and uh, the hypotenuse and a leg are enough to determine similarity because since this is a right triangle, this force is, for instance, this angle, and then we have AA similarity. This is not encompassed by anything else because if we think about it with this notation, it's uh, SSA because the angle is not the one between the two sides. Here we have an example of right triangle similarity. This problem can actually be done in several ways. You have enough information that you can probably just write out a bunch of Pythagorean theorem, but that is very tedious and time consuming. And I think the similar triangles are the best way for this. So first we start with some angles. 
let this angle be, say, theta. This angle is 90 degrees. And since the angles in a triangle add to 180, this is 90 minus theta. Now, angle B is 90 degrees. So considering triangle CQB, since the sum of the angles is 180 degrees, this angle must also be theta. We also have a right angle here and a right angle here. So that tells us that triangle BAP it P is similar to triangle CRB. And this is the notation for two triangles being similar. Since this is a square, these side lengths are the same. Let's call them S. Looking at the corresponding sides on the triangle, one pair is S over is S and 13, which is um, AB over BP. The corresponding pair would be CR over CB. And if we use the Pythagorean theorem just once, we can get that CR is the square root of S squared minus 36. And this gives us this relation. From here, we can rearrange this. Square. Um, and then we can use the quadratic formula or something on S squared, or we can just try factoring this. And if we factor this, we get S squared minus four times 13. S squared minus nine times 13 is zero. We want the area of the square, which is S squared. So it's either 52, which is four times 13, or 117, which is nine times 13. You can note that 52 is not an answer choice, so that immediately tells you that the answer is 117. Another way to do this is that S must be, like you can also do this by looking at requirements on the sizes, for instance, from the hypotenuse being greater than the legs to decide that it must be the larger one. So that gives you 117. Are there any questions about that? Okay. This is another problem about similar triangles. So here we have a trapezoid, which just means that one pair of sides are parallel. We also have this condition that AD is perpendicular to BD. And size B, C, and CD are both equal to 43. You have this midpoint of BD, which is P, and you also take the intersection of AC with BD, which is O. You are given that this length OP is equal to 11, and you want to uh, find the length AD, which is this length. So first you can note that because triangle BCD is isosceles, CP forms a right angle with line BD. Also, we have that BP over BD equals one half. This is a length ratio, and we already have a many uh, right angles. So we can try to find similar triangles. Let's say this angle is theta. Then because we have a, wait, um, actually no, let's say that this angle is theta. Because line CD and BA are parallel, uh, this angle is also theta. 
that comes from the transversal properties that I think are covered in school. If these lines are parallel, then these angles are equal. I don't remember the term for that, but if you search transversals, you can probably find it. So now we have an angle of theta and a right angle, an angle of theta and a right angle. So that tells us that triangle B, D, A is similar to triangle D, P, C. Then B, D over D, P equals D, A over P, C equals B, A over C, D. And BD over DP, for the same reason as why this is 1 half, is equal to 2. We already know that CD equals 43. That was given in the problem. So BA is equal to 86. We also have another pair of similar triangles. We have this angle theta and by, um, I don't remember the term, but I think this is also covered in school. For instance, like just these two angles being equal. This is also theta. So that also gives us another pair of similar triangles. And that tells us that um, I think I'm doing something slightly wrong here. Um, yeah, you can actually find a slightly different angle, a, a slightly different similar triangle pair from the same point O. Since you already have this angle theta and this angle theta, and for the same reason as I mentioned above, a bit earlier, these two angles are also equal. So that gives us that triangle ABO is similar to triangle COD. And the reason why this is a better similarity than um, so what I was saying earlier about COP and AOD is that we don't actually know any of the lengths of those two triangles other than OP. And the angle condition doesn't give us too much new information anyway. Here we just want the similar triangles for the purpose of lengths. So that doesn't really tell us much that we need. But from here, we have AB over CO equals AO over CD equals BO over OD. Actually, no, this should be CDO because um, when we write similar triangles, it doesn't really matter what order we write them in, but we want, for instance, the angle corresponding to the angle at point A to be equal to the angle at point C, the angle at point B to be angle, equal to the angle at point D, et cetera. And this just makes it easier for when we try to write the length conditions. So now we have A, B over C, D equals B, O over O, D equals A, O over O, C. We focus on the first two conditions. We already saw that AB over CD is equal to two. So BO over OD is also equal to two. We know BP is equal to PD, so let BP, um, so uh, we don't need to actually define a variable for BP because we know that BO is equal to BP plus 11 and OD equals BP minus 11. 
because it's actually dp minus 11, but we know that bp and dp are equal since p was defined as the midpoint. So bp plus 11 over bp minus 11 equals 2. And from this, multiplying both sides by the denominator and rearranging, you can get that bp equals 33. So BP equals 33. That means BD equals 2 times 33 equals 66. This is B, this is D, this is A. We already found these two lengths and we want this length. Now we finish with the Pythagorean theorem. It is 86 squared minus 66 squared. And you can expand this if you want. I find it easier to use difference of squares. It just states that this is 86 minus 66, 86 plus 66, which is 20 times 152. And then there's 4 times 5 times 4 times 38. So it's root 4 times 4, root 5 times 38. So it's 4 root 190. And if we look at the answer, it's m root n, which is 4 root 190. We want m plus n, which is 4 plus 190, 194. Are there any questions? Another important technique in in C geometry is trying to find symmetry and explaining the symmetry. So this is this doesn't really have much theory about it. It's just something you try when you see problems and you don't know how to do them. So it's best explained directly by an example. This was actually from last year's turn A. So here we have a. Uh, that is a bad diagram. Here we have BCAD is an isosceles trapezoid. And this point P has one, two, three, four as its distances from the rest of the points. This is a very weird condition because we don't really know much about what we can tell from here. There's no right angles, for instance. And if we do something like dropping this, this doesn't tell us much either. It tells us what this squared minus this squared is. Let's say this is B, this is A. It tells us that, and this is H. It tells us that B squared plus H squared equals nine and A squared plus H squared equals four by the Pythagorean theorem. So that gives us b minus a times b plus a equals five. b plus a is a sign with bc, but b minus a isn't anything nice. So this is a promising approach, but it doesn't work. And now we also can notice that there's no equal angles here. We don't even have the lines AC and BD, so we can't use transversals. We don't have any three points on the same line. So we have to look for some extra point we can construct to manipulate symmetry. And to do that, since this is an isosceles trapezoid, we can take these midpoints. And this is actually a perpendicular line to the parallel sides. If we reflect P across this, we get this point Q. And I'm going to redraw this. This is B, this is C, this is P, this is Q, this is A, this is D. We know that P equals two and PC equals three. But now, since we reflected it, 
BQ equals three and CQ equals two. And if we recall that our attempt of dropping altitudes didn't work, but was promising because it involved the sidelines, we can try that again. Now that we have some symmetry. Um, so let's call these heights H and big H. And let's call these sides A and B. And we now have two points that have much in common. So instead of not knowing anything about this difference B minus A, we can instead work with this portion. These form a rectangle, so they are actually equal. Let's call these C and C. Pythagorean theorem for the upper isosceles trapezoid tells us that a squared plus h squared equals four and a plus c squared plus h squared equals nine. Subtracting this, c squared plus two ac equals five. We can do something similar for the lower one. b squared plus h squared equals one b plus c squared plus h squared equals four. So c squared plus two a uh, plus two b c equals 15. And um, if we factor this, it's c times c plus two a equals five, c times c plus two b equals 15. We still have one term that's equal to the side length, c plus 2a is bc, and c plus 2b equals ad. And as before, in our previous approach, we have one term that we don't really know much about. But now that we've added the symmetry, there's one important difference, which is that instead of having this random length and this random length, which we can't really compare, we have two equal lengths. C and C are equal to each other here. <clears throat> so now if we take this quotient, we get BC over AD because the T's cancel out. And we also get five over 15, which is one third. So it gives us our answer of one third. Are there any questions? Okay, that is all. That is all for today. Thank you for joining. So, uh, I will stop the recording here.